Welcome to today's Sticky Learning. This is going to be slightly different. As I said before, this is going to be a super niche presentation series talking about category management. We're just going to give it a few more seconds while we're waiting for the last attendees to arrive in the room. Just going to give that a moment. Welcome, Colin. Good to see you. Thanks for being here. Darren, thank you for being here, it's appreciated. Fabian, good to see you again. Jim, I think this is your first time attendee to these sessions. Thanks very much for being here, really appreciated. Tim, always a pleasure to see you. Thank you very much. Let's get you guys set up for success initially. So as always, what I wanna make sure we're covering is getting our mobile phones. Let's get the mobile phones, get the little airplane lit up, Let's zero out the distraction, 100% attention on what we're doing here today. Also making sure you're hydrated, so making sure you've got a drink available, herbal teas for me today. Let's keep ourselves, you know, keep ourselves hydrated so we can keep our brains lubricated. And also making sure that we've got a fresh page for fresh thinking. So we want a nice blank page, and at the top of that, we want to write keepers. We also want to write in there the 73% funnel, which is what we're going to be covering today as we talk about category management. And Andy's going to be covering more of that in just a second. Top of that page, keepers. These are the things you want to remember. These are the things that you want to be reminded of. And these are the things when you reread it, that it reignites that thinking and makes the learning stick, which is what we're here to do. Now, that's what MBM is all about. So let's see who else we've got coming in. Right. Let's get into this. I've got my notepad and my pen ready. I've got a series of questions to be firing into Andy as we go through this. Welcome to today's Sticky Learning Lunch with myself, Nathan Simmons, Senior Leadership Coach and Trainer for MBM. I'm joined today by Andy Palmer, Resident Expert on Category Management. And the idea of these training sessions is to help you be the best version of you in the work that you do. And whether that's whether you're, whether you're at home or returning to work or preparing to return to work, it's about pushing this thinking. It's about helping you take your business to the next level. And as we are the leadership development and soft skills provider to the UK grocery and manufacturing industry, it's right that we talk about category management. Andy, these next seven sessions, they're all yours and you're going to take us through this. Please you know, take over and let's see what category management is all about and how it can help these people. Lovely. Thank you, Nathan. Uh, welcome, everybody. I'm super excited to be sharing this content with you. Um, over the coming days, we're going to take you through our seven step category management process. Um, session each day, looking at each different stage of the funnel, bringing it to life. Now, to manage expectations, I guess we're only going to be scratching the surface, um, but hopefully leaving you hungry to want to reach out to us afterwards um, and learn more, learn how we can support you with category management. So starting with that, what is category management? Um, it's one of these topics that's been wrapped up quite heavily and shrouded in a dark mist of jargon and complicated terminology. Um, in essence, it's about helping you as a business to be able to identify more opportunities, sell opportunities, and land those opportunities in store. Um, the crux of category management is really about uh, suppliers working in partnership with retailers and making sure the consumers, the shoppers' needs are at the heart of any decisions that are made. So um, whereas we see our account managers taking care of a certain slice of the pie, we have our category managers that are there to take care of the whole pie. So uh, as category management has, has developed over the years where it's first started in its inception back in the 1990s, um, for me, this is really now about a business as usual principle, not something that's dipped into once every six months where people lock themselves in uh, dark war rooms and generate a million and one different spreadsheets. It's actually about a very simple structured approach that we're going to come through to um, they're helping you be able to identify more opportunities so we're going to talk you through our funnel um, we're largely going to do a brief introduction to the funnel in a moment um, and then helping you understand what each of those different areas look like so it's about agreeing category targets at the top we're going to talk about that a little bit more today about keeping the shopper at the heart of our decisions we'll get into that a little bit more tomorrow then around understanding and knowing the channels that you're in, so what supermarket or particular uh, retailer that you're focusing your efforts. Then getting into uh, the good stuff, getting into identifying opportunities. They're going to come from uh, lots of different areas, 
with capital management, it's very, very data driven. Um, so often we can get lost in that and we're going to help you to not get lost in that, but around identifying the opportunities. Then it's about selling those opportunities effectively, landing those opportunities in store, and then coming back around our funnel, um, evaluating, improving, ensure that you've got this consistency and we've got the cycle going on. Now, to manage expectations and to a slight caveat, why these funnel stages literally build on each other, it's a bit more like a, think about it as a Venn diagram. They've got to overlap. You are going to do some level of recycling back through different areas. Um, it's not that chunk start, stop, start, stop, start, stop all the way through. So we've got this process. We're going to bring it to life a little bit more today. Um, hopefully that then generates some questions for, for you. Um, once we've got those questions, we'll be able to bring it to life. So we'll spend about the next 10, 15 minutes, some questions to Nathan, to me, um, some questions from you guys as well. Um, and we'll see if we can bring this topic a little bit more to life and uh, hopefully help you realize how you can identify, sell and land some more opportunities. And for me, Andy was talking about the questions. If you do have questions, you've got the question box, please get them in there. I'm watching this to, for Andy to support in this conversation. If anything comes up and you want to go deeper into that, let's bring that up and if it's appropriate to answer it here and now we will do if not we can take that offline and we'll get in contact with you separately to help support that the other thing that sarah so lovingly reminded me of is if you're looking at the screen um with the cameras on at the moment i'm going to drop off that screen and sit in the background and watch what's going on but there's a gray bar in the middle there if you want to make the webcams bigger click and hold on that gray bar pull it down and you can make the presentation just that little bit smaller so you can see more of what's going on in the whiteboard okay as I say, any questions, get them in the question box and I'll be paying attention in the background. Thanks very much. Great stuff. Thank you, Nathan. Um, OK, so we're talking about our funnel here and we've got these seven steps that I briefly covered. Um, as I said, we're going to work through each of those uh, different areas um, over the next uh, seven days. We're going to start today with agreeing category opportunities. So more often than not, um, we work with clients and they're busy doing category management in a way that they've already done it. Um, recently, we started working with a client and they said, yeah, we've got all this data, we've got all this information, we're at the beck and call of the buyer. Um, and I said to them, okay, great. So what are you looking to achieve with your category? And they said, um, well, whatever the buyer tells us to do, we will do it. Um, whatever opportunities pop up, we will make them happen. Um, and if we spot some along the way ourselves, we we'll get those landed as well. And that's fine, that's not necessarily the wrong way. Where we tried to steer them to was actually, if they have a single, absolute, clarified target, all of the efforts are then focused on achieving that. And it's not this scattergun approach that they seem to be um, working towards, it's far more uh, sniper rifle, it, it's there. We've got our category target, and we're gonna go after that. That then means all the time, and the resources and the efforts they put in are focused on achieving one thing. And that doesn't mean to say that uh, category can't, target can't change, um, and it will, of course, adapt and develop. But actually, once you've got that category target, it then allows a far more uh, joined up approach to, to take place and not just becoming kind of quite reactive. Um, as I mentioned earlier, category management, very, very data driven. Uh, it's often the case that we can get sucked into this black hole of data. Um, stuck on what we class as the PowerPoint treadmill of churning out presentation after presentation, category review after category review, and it's all just information give as opposed to leading and working towards achieving something that's um, that's being predefined. So we want to spend today looking at agreeing category targets. I've got a couple of things that I'll share with you. Of course, um, it's a very big topic. Um, but actually, if you've got a couple of things you could take away today that kind of gets you thinking a little bit differently, then uh, Jobs are good. So the first thing I want to share with you, um, and, and again, I mentioned that uh, category management is often um, shrouded in jargon and uh, various different acronyms and, and, and complicated language. I'm going to do that now, which uh, kind of almost makes me sound a little bit uh, hypocritical. But actually, let's try and keep it in simple, plain language. Here's an opportunity that you could take to develop your own category target. So. We call this WAP, FOP, or PEN. Um, effectively, it's weight of purchase, frequency of purchase, or penetration. Now, to bring that out into that true kind of simple language, weight of purchase is how much people are spending on the products they're buying. It's that difference between 
get in to buy 99p a pack of tomatoes or try to trade them, trade them up to a £1.49 pack of tomatoes and we can increase their weight of purchase. Or we could go after their frequency, how often they're buying. Are they buying once a month, twice a month, once a year, five times a year? And again, we can start to increase their frequency of purchase or penetration. Again, bringing it back into very simple language is how many, how many shoppers have we got buying this? What's the percentage of our customer base or what's the percentage of the population who are buying this? So whether it's where to purchase, how much they're buying, how much they're spending, how often they're buying or how many shoppers we've got, we could pick one of these particular areas and then target all of our um, efforts towards it. If it is penetration, um, we want to attract more shoppers. We maybe want to attract some lap shoppers. Once we know that and we've run the data and we've got brilliant, you know, we've got 10% um, less shoppers than we did this time last year, we can then figure out what we do. It could be some work around promotional planning, it could be some work around range architecture, it could be some work around availability, but at least we're focused on achieving something. So my suggestion would be um, typically pick one of those areas, um, only one, um, and then work towards it. I say only one because, um, Something like frequency and penetration kind of go hand in hand. It's a bit like a seesaw as penetration goes up and we attract more shoppers, our frequency tends to go down. Um, and that's because we attract those new shoppers, but they're not core shoppers yet. Likewise, if we increase frequency, penetration tends to go down. And there's that trade off. So don't think you can do all of those at the same time. Pick one and then maybe you do one, then the next, then the next, and maybe recycle and kind of uh, rework that process through. Um, I'm hoping that's making sense. Um, Nathan, I'm sure, is going to chip in at any point and tell me to, uh, um, we've got a question if you've got it or uh, you build on that. And, you know, the question is, how important is it then to be focusing on one of those elements? You know, and when you do focus it, do you go through the funnel with that one element first and then look at a different one to then run it through the funnel again? Absolutely. So um, if, for example, I was going to pick any one of those three, so I'm going to pick penetration, I would pick penetration as my category target. I would look at the data and figure out what is penetration now? What do I want to get it to? From there, I can then calculate that size of the price. So I know it's worth um, a million pounds. And of course, I'm going to want to set myself a, uh, a smart target. I'm going to want to set myself a time scale that I want to achieve it. So I go, I want to increase penetration by three percentage points. three percent new customers, um, and I want to achieve that by November 2018, 2018, gosh, I wish, 2021, and um, uh, that's worth an additional two million pounds in sales. So once I've got my target, as I then more better understand the shopper, more better align my recommendations to the supermarket, look for those opportunities, sell them, and et cetera, then I've got absolute focus on uh, where I'm going. Once I've achieved it, absolutely, I could then pick one of the others, or I could pick the same one again and go harder at it again. It's just about focusing my time, my resources, uh, and the effort into the right place. And I'm wondering, as you're saying that, kind of from a coaching point of view, is there an opportunity to run all three of them at the same time with maybe individuals in your team? So you've got your people, three different people in your team trained on category management. One can take penetration, one can take weight, one can take frequency and run them all at the same time, or, or does it need to be concentrated on that one element first of all? I pick one element um, because of the, you know, the potential trade-off that you've got or the conflict you've got going on between them. So if you've got one person running off over there, let's get some more customers. You've got another person running off over there, let's get them buying more often. You've got another person running off over there, um, let's get them spending more. They're potentially just going to be trading off against each other. Actually, get all the people in the business focusing on the same thing to achieve it. And I mentioned that example earlier that if we push penetration and we get more shoppers, frequency is going to go down. So person A is going to win, but person B is not. And it's not about that. It's about what's right for the category. So we've got to analyze the data, find out where the true category opportunities exist. And then all of the team, all of my team focusing on uh, delivering that. Good. So why is it important then to get this stage of the funnel right? As with anything, if we haven't got targets, we haven't got goals, we haven't got those visions, then we're just running around. We never know when we've actually got there. Um, and if we'd actually get there, we, did we get there by luck? So having that target just focuses the effort, keeps us kind of on that smart, uh, that smart track to success. 
as Colin's come in here is, you know, I guess we have to be mindful of the conf of confusing the buyer. Absolutely. And it's the same with goal setting and setting targets. You know, vague goals lead to vague results. So if we're not clear at the beginning of the funnel where, where we're going as a business and where we're going as an organisation, the consumer isn't going to know, or, you know, let alone the buyer or the consumer isn't going to actually know uh, what we're actually trying to achieve with that. Absolutely. Um, uh, um Again, coming into this terminology thing, are we talking about the buyer, who's the person sat at uh, the retailer's head office, or are we talking about the buyer, actually that person who's pushing the shopping trolley, carrying the basket? And, and, and equally, those important it's the shopper, it's us as a supplier, it's the retailer, all working in absolute partnership, because you're right, we don't want to be confusing the shopper in store. We want to be in our chosen uh, supermarket, for example. Uh, we've only got split seconds each individual fixer to make our shopping decision. We know those categories out there that are particularly complicated to shop and we know those ones that uh, have just got it right and it's easy but it's easy because a lot of time and effort was put into it to get the fixture laid out correctly, the promotional strategy right, the packaging, the merchandising, the whole lot. That, that's all been considered. Um, so you'll think about those categories in store and you go oh I've got to go over to category X or it's just a bit horrible over there versus Oh, I'm going to go and have a look at uh, that category. Purchase it. Um, I know what I'm going to find. I know what I'm going to want. I know how to find it, and I know the pricing is going to be where my expectations are. Nice. And is there a running order to these? Is one of them more important than the other? And should we be starting a weight and then going into frequency, or is there just whatever is needed at that point in time? Uh, typically, you'd always go, "Oh, we want to attract more shoppers." Um, there's more shoppers, more people buying, and we can convert more people to be picking up our products. But the reality is until we've got into the data and figured out what the opportunity size actually is, um, we don't know. Um, category management is not about gut feel and uh, intuition. It is about a very data-led discipline that says, actually, the data is telling me it's penetration. We've got less shoppers, frequencies up, and we, we can get into all of that information. We know through all the different data sources that exist out there, um, put all that information in uh, and then and figure out what the right one to go after is. Good. And where have you seen this done really well? Um, we worked with hundreds of clients over the last, I've been doing training on this particular topic, uh, topic for the last 20 years. Prior to that, I was a category manager. Um, I've seen it done very well in certain areas and very badly in, in, in probably an equal amount. That's changed now because those people we work with are now working uh, far more smarter. Getting this stage absolutely right is key. Um, I could pick a number of uh, different categories that we've worked with. Maybe that's not necessarily appropriate to share with you right now. Um, but those, those people that have just, or those companies that have just got it right. Um, and you can probably consider your own shopping experiences uh, when you're in store. Um, chance are, if you're having a good shopping experience in a good category, it's because they have good category management. So thinking about that, you know, is how does this funnel then vary to other category management models? Yeah, so um, th there, of course, are a number of models out there that have been developed over the time. The original category management model was developed by a company called TPG, the partnering group, um, an American consultancy that came over to the UK back in the 1990s. Their process, the eight-step process, still works well. Um, but it was set for a different age. It was set for where teams of people would go and lock themselves in dark rooms for three to six months at a time, complete a million and one, literally a million and one different templates um, and come out and then start implementing it. Um, for me, the process still works well, albeit it needs streamlining. Um, hence why we think this model works um, nicely because it's about business as usual. It's about this constant you know, focus on the consumer not just locking ourselves away every six months and coming out with a category review. Um, so yeah, loads of models out there, not my place to start damning them. Um, we think uh, we think and approve that this model is fit for today's uh, markets. And I think the, the benefit of this model is it's a very fast, um, reflective model. So even if you're starting at the top in a category inside your business, you walk into an aisle, you look at what your product's doing, you have this as a framework that you can quickly filter through by looking at what you're actually doing and go back to the drawing board the moment you get back in the car, sit with your team and then start having that conversation as you go back through these seven steps again. Absolutely. Yeah, and it is about that, that um, joined up approach um, where you know, we've got absolute focus on 
working out what this category needs to make it more successful, to make the shopping experience more enjoyable, to ensure that it uh, remains profitable. Um, you know, we are looking to drive revenue and turnover through categories that has to be profitable. And yet at the same time, we want to make sure, of course, that the, the shopper, the purchaser, the buyer's decisions um, and experiences is a positive one. Um, this one's slightly a, a contentious um, thought. Let me, let me see if I can draw this up. Um, so typically you have, that's um, not an egg, it's going to be a pie chart in a minute, but typically you have a category. Um, and within the category, there's a number of products um, that sit within it. Um, within most businesses, they will then have an account manager and, and that particular business will supply a certain proportion of the products to that particular category. It, it's very rare that a category has one, uh, one supplier supplying everything, it does happen, most categories have a number of suppliers working in and they have a different portion of the business with some overlap and some dual supply of certain products. Typically then what sits here is an account manager that's taking care of the slice of the pie. And that account manager has various opportunities over the year to grow the business. It could be through uh, an increase in distribution of their particular products or it could be because they were successful at winning um, uh, some new business, maybe through a tender or um, whatever other there it is, but typically we see that the account manager can gain or lose between five and 15% of the pie on average. So they're there within the business to trying to grow their own business's business. And then you've got the category managers. The category managers are not only responsible for this portion of the pie, but they're responsible for the entire pie. Sometimes they supply those products, sometimes they're competitive for those. The important bit is they're trying to grow the pie. Now, if they successfully grow that pie, the opportunity for their business is huge. And yes, of course, they may benefit their competitors at the same time, but it's a win-win. The opportunities that exist here for their own business will eclipse that increase that the account manager potentially gets. Now, it's controversial because typically the power and the importance sits with the account managers. My challenge back to Many suppliers is how much time and effort do we put into category management? Because if our category managers are doing their job well, the opportunities are significant. So there's two kind of directions my brain goes in here. There's an opportunity here to support the development of category management thinking across multiple, so for example, Heinz baked beans or baked beans as a whole. If every category manager in the baked beans industry was actually working so that they could be expanding the opportunity for everybody, therefore everyone gets a bigger slice of the pie because the pie is expanding. The Absolutely. other part, um, I was going to say, the other part of my thinking is then actually giving those account managers a certain amount of category management understanding so that they, when they're in store and they're looking at it, they can then be feeding that back into the business operation to help that that meaningful dialogue that's helping expanding the opportunities across the whole business, not just through the category manager. Absolutely. Um, to to the second point, um, we've seen a lot of companies move into a more of a hybrid role where the category manager and the account manager, the lines are becoming blurred and they're almost starting to become mm -hmm. one and the same thing. Now, of course, they need to take care of their accounts. That's what they're being paid for. They also need to be there to identify, sell and land opportunities for the entire category. Um, once you've got that going on, you've then got the buyer at the head office, whether it's uh, any of the major multiples, minor multiples or retailers, and um, you're there then their best friend because you're helping them achieve their overall target, not just taking care of your slice of the pie. So those lines have definitely got blurred. Um, and to your point earlier yeah, about baked beans, how do we define the baked beans category? Is baked beans the category or does it sit in a wider category of canned foods, canned veg? Um, it, it's really important. Each category needs to be clearly defined as to where that um, yeah, where, where, where that product or group of products sits, and that needs to come from the eyes of the shopper. Uh, it needs to have absolute clarity on how the shopper sees that particular area, and then we then align our thinking towards it and get that target set up. Brilliant. I'm conscious of time. It's already 24 minutes past one. So look. Um, for those that are in right now, and you know, this again, we talk about this being a superbly niche uh, area of grocery manufacturing business. What's been useful so far? Uh, what are you taking away? What's been of value? And just while those are coming in, and if you've got any questions, bring them into the chat box now. You know, bring them into the questions box and ask them so we can get into those. 
while I was thinking about that, and we're talking about maybe those account managers as well as the category and, and those those job roles, like we talk about the Venn diagram, but those overlapping, what we're going to do is we're going to share a copy of the white paper. I think it's the ultimate guide for category management. So there's a white paper there that can be shared with your account managers free of charge. It's, it's a free resource. So where you're blurring those job descriptions to create more opportunities for your business, it gives them a focal point or a, a concept to be working with where they can start to understand this model and create those opportunities live in the moment when they're in store and when they're with the people. Good, ultimate guides there. Also talking about, we touched very briefly on the smart targets as well. We started looking at that clarity of target. Um, and sorry, so yeah, give us a quick idea uh, of an example of how to calculate a category target and, and make it smart. Um, gosh, okay, well, I could probably spend about the next three or four hours on that one. Um, so I'm going to be very mindful of time. <laughs> Yeah, there are loads of different ways of calculating um, the size of the price. Um, you can come at it from a bunch of different ways. Um, what I won't do is kind of go down into too low level of detail and start talking about the uh, various actual calculations that you can do. My suggestion would be, um, if you're unsure on how to, um, or where to look for your category target, is to start with hypotheses, um, not necessarily starting with the data. So if you start with hypotheses that says, I believe my category has less shoppers than it did a year ago. I believe my availability is worse than it was six months ago. I believe there are better opportunities in new product or existing product development. Develop all those hypotheses that you've got and then test them. Test them part with data, which would be the quantitative stuff, or you may need to look at it from a more qualitative point of view, visit some stores, get out there. Once you've got a better understanding of the, whether your hypotheses are right or wrong, they will then in turn start to generate um, various opportunities. You can then start to calculate the size of those opportunities. Um, that then allows you to then prioritize, um, prioritize the time and the efforts you've got it. Quick, quick one. Um, Let's we'll see if this will work. Uh, simple Boston matrix, we're very familiar with those. If I've got um, big opportunities in terms of the value, not so much. Can I implement it now or is it going to take me six years? I develop those hypotheses, prove them right or wrong, and I can then start thinking that's worth a lot and it's going to take a reasonable amount of time. That's not worth as much, but I can get it done now. That's worth a lot, but it's going to take me six years. You can start to plot your various opportunities. You then know that it's these bigger, quicker up to land opportunities, the way you should be putting your time and effort in. And you basically start to filter again, filter this stuff down to, to get you to a place of going, right, we are going after that opportunity there. We know it's worth two million quid. We know we're going to get it landed within 12 months. All of my time and efforts are going to start to work towards achieving that. Appreciate going at pace. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. But then, like, like you say, mapping those things out, you can you can be specific. How much is it worth? Is it measurable? Okay, how how do we know if we're getting there or we're moving towards it? Is it achievable? Is it relevant? Is it time bound? And all those elements to make it smart. Um, yeah, Colin, okay. sorry, go on, Nathan. I was going to say, you know, Colin's brought in a point here. You know, this that is about partnership, not pure competition. And actually, I think more internally when category management and sales you know account managers are getting together that, that's about working together but also working across the industries and other sectors and, and other groups as well and, and maybe having a bit more of a collaborative conversation about where the business is going absolutely collaboration and partnership not just between supplier and retailer and shopper but actually dare i say it between different suppliers now i know this is possible because this is my background we used to have supply based meetings where we'd get five or six suppliers in the room um, and start to figure out how we would drive this category forward. Yes, of course, there's going to be that natural and sometimes healthy competition to, to look after ourselves, but actually the bigger opportunities happen out here by growing this category, not just stealing sales from product A into product B and vice versa, but as we run these various different promotions or these various different pieces of activity. Once we can get this category joined up and everyone focused internally your own business other businesses if, if that's appropriate um then, then you're on your way to success and you'll see those categories that have gone on and made that stuff happen sometimes it's led by the brands sometimes it's led by own label suppliers it doesn't matter it doesn't matter if you're the biggest supplier or the smallest supplier if you've got the eyes and the ears and you understand the shopper and your approach is that of driving true categories 
through category sustainable growth, then uh, you're onto a winner. Amazing. And that leads to kind of almost uh, uh, segues us into tomorrow's session. So we're going to put the link in for tomorrow's session for uh, Sticky Learning Lunch tomorrow, which is part two of the funnel, which is actually understanding your shopper. So we're going to get into that in more depth tomorrow. So calls to action from this conversation right now. One, if you haven't registered for tomorrow's session, this is relevant to you, get registered for tomorrow's session. The link is there. Two, if you want to share this information and support your business, your account managers and all those people, there is a free ultimate guide there to category management. So it's there to support you and your team getting that understanding so they can help grow the opportunities. And you know, if more questions come up, please email them to us. Prepare, prepare them for us for tomorrow so that we can then you know, bring that to life in what we're doing and what we're talking about, understanding your shopper uh, and giving you more information to improve your category management. I hope this is useful. Thank you very much for the day, Andy. Massive appreciation for you being here to share that. Thank you. No, my pleasure, Nathan. And I think it's just to build on that point is um, hoping you're getting a sense of the passion I've got for this particular topic. Um, if there are those of you out there who want to bounce ideas or, or thoughts or challenge me on some stuff, drop me an email, give me a call, reach out to us. Um, we can make my details available. I'm happy to talk that stuff through. Where that takes us, I don't mind. The important thing is that we, uh, we have the conversation. And we start building that funnel for people. Everyone, thanks very much for your time today. Really appreciate it. And I look forward to seeing you at one o'clock tomorrow for another Sticky Learning Lunch. Thanks a lot. Thank you.